This is the Blockade Pinball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Freebus, a.k.a. Shut Your Trap. Joining me, as always, halfway across the world, Jared Morgan. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, folks. I don't know what time it is or what day it is. You know, it's, whatever. it's, you know, the sun is out. That's all that matters, it's, right? It's Munfry, it's Munfry Thursday, Wednesday. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Depending on when you're <laughs> viewing this, too, it doesn't really matter. So It's right. <laughs> it's material. <laughs> one, one thing we do know. One, is 2021. B2, holidays happened, and, you know, they weren't too shabby. Um, hmm. And uh, C, uh, as the title of this episode is, can we just, we, we can't just push reset and everything goes back to normal? It, it, I mean, I thought mm. that was the whole point of being in a new year. No? It, we still got to no. deal with crap? Oh. I think I'd like, you know, I, I think we're still within that seven-day return policy for, <laughs> for, for 2021. I'd like my money back, please. <laughs> Um, I just, I just, I really, what, mm, I'm sure Jared's hopes are this too. Um, Everything that we were promised pinball wise, hopefully this year happens. Yeah, it's it's this year now. So (laughs) this is 2020 B. Right. So, right. This was 2020A. So, so all A those, all the, all the Zen uh, releases that we are going to be promised, yes. And yeah. all those pinball cabinets we were promised, yes. Yeah, this year. <laughs> this year. Yeah. yeah. This, this one. Yeah. All those yeah. movies that we were promised. Yes. You know, it's. Yes. It's, uh... <laughs> Life we... returns to normal. Well, sort of. Ish. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You know, we we can't have everything that uh, that we want right off the bat. Um, I will say that I and I'm I'm late to this because as is with most video games on console, um, I tend to wait until there's a massive DLC download that you can just get on disc. Get get it on Game of the Year edition. Yes, that's yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Um, or that there's a massive price drop. And so, sure enough, this this uh, year, that's why I just played and finished Last of Us Part Two. Yeah. And I gotta say, the controversies that people are bringing up with it, really? <laughs> there's controversies with the game. Oh Sorry. man, there's I'll massive controversies. Well, part of the controversies happen to do with, and and I will admit, it's brutal because um, I didn't read anything about this prior to. I want to say spoiler free. So I didn't read anything about the game prior to release. Mm-hmm. So right. I was coming at it first first time reaction basically. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's continuation of the previous story and you've got your your main character Ellie and uh who's the who was the the girl but she's now grown up by what 5 years or so basically. Um you know, we like Ellie. And we get introduced to this new character, Abby. And it's like, oh, okay, we're going to be dancing between these two characters. And so we start playing as Abby, and Abby's from an outsider group. And real soon, Abby does some stuff that don't make you like Abby no more. <laughs> right, okay. And it was like, okay, so then you start playing the game a lot as Ellie, and and, and Ellie's kind of got her, her, her target set on Abby. And then the game shifts and has you play as Abby for a really extended period of time. Oh. This character that you do not like in the least. And right. and I've said this a, a while ago that my first playthrough of Last of Us didn't go so well. I had to reframe my, my thinking about how to play it. And I basically, it was because in the time that I st- tried starting it and the second time I tried playing it, The Walking Dead had come out and I applied that mentality to my enjoyment of the game and it improved it massively. I loved the first game. So I've still mm-hmm. got that. I'm just playing a alternate universe Walking Dead, basically. Right. And one of the things that The Walking Dead has toyed with but never has really uh, delved into is, like, really delved into, is what if your side isn't right? (laughs) What if the other side has an equally valid point of view and you're the enemy, right? And so by force... So if the zombies were actually the good guys and you're the bad guys, essentially. No, no, no. It's it's if the other human groups that are roaming around that were you're fighting amongst. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. How, who says that, you know, they're fighting for survival too. And so by making you play as Abby, you... Get a different perspective. 
Exactly. You start seeing mm-hmm. it from their end and being like, hey, these people did this wrong to us. And that's why we went and are to them and they're perceiving that as the first wrong. But no, they already did a wrong to us. And so you start doing that. But the, mm-hmm. the, the moment that was just like really brutal in there was you're playing as Abby and you're beating the ever living crap out of Ellie. And the oh, game is right. making you do this. Oh, jeez. That'd be pretty hard. <laughs> it's it's like, is there an option to not throw punches, please? Because I don't want to be I, doing this. Can I just, like, accept that I've done the beating and, and just move past this part? Is, yeah. is that all yeah. right? It's like closing your eyes in a horror movie, right? Right. <laughs> you don't want to see it. So apparently there was a lot of people that were upset about the... the that the, the sort beating. Of thing. Well, it's not the beating, but it's it's that having you play a character that you really despise um, for such an extended period of time. Uh, but like I said, I took it for what it was, and in the moment, as I'm that character, they never have you as that character hunting the other group. There's this third group that both sides don't like that you're still mm. hunting those. And I'm this person that just whenever I was, what I love about the game. I love stealth killing. I hate jumping into the middle of a fracas. I just like picking people off one by one and being the angel of death. <laughs> right. So you like you like um, Metal Gear Solid a lot then? I used to. I didn't care for this last one that I tried it. It mm. went a little too Kojima for me. Um... <laughs> uh, a little too Kojima. Is that the thing, is it? <laughs> he, um... He's got a style. Hmm. And he really let that style freak flag fly, where it's like whenever a new character is introduced, all of a sudden there's dramatic music and their name appears like it's G.I. Joe or something, you know, and some oh, wacky yeah. name and, and you're like, Oh my god, really? And you know, and then the dialogue starts and when he gets into dialogue it just goes on and on and on <laughs> and on. So. so it's more of a it's it's middle gear dialogue rather than middle gear solid. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, I but I will credit Metal Gear is what got me into stealth killing. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's that's yeah, right. I get great enjoyment out of out of sneaking up and hearing somebody muffle cry and somebody else go, What happened? Where'd they go? <laughs> <laughs> so no, Fair the enough, the, yeah. the other controversy wound up being uh, uh there wound up being a a trans character in the game and I guess then people were saying if you didn't like the game, you were transphobic just because oh, really? this character was... It apparently took on a whole life of its own. And I'm glad I didn't read any of that stuff because it was just like, really, folks? <laughs> well, that's just silly. You, you can dislike a game just because you didn't like... A character. The, the gameplay. an element of the game. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, that's, valid. that's a valid reason not to like a game, yeah. strangely enough. But so, yeah, that's, that's what I did. You know, watched... Pandem- or played pandemic style end of the world gaming during a pandemic during a pandemic at the end of this year <laughs> but now I'm on so, happier things now I'm, now I'm back to uh, playing Spider-Man so <laughs> swinging around the city with with ease and abandon that's right with um, ease and people. abandon hey uh okay so during this time period Suddenly, the pinball cabinets started dropping to mm. select people for review purposes. Yes. Um, in terms of the arcade one-up cabinets, uh, Doug, also known as Cool Toy, he got the marble cabinet. Uh, Retro Ralph, he got the Star Wars cabinet. Um, both of them did really, really high-quality videos. <laughs> I gotta say, I'm kind of impressed. Um, mm-hmm. That break down the machines and and show the builds and you know all the features and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, in terms of reviewing, though, the software, there's things that I know that you and I want to know. <laughs> and nobody's really yeah. touching upon that. And it, it kind of bugs me because I'm like, the big reason why, and, and I see this in the comments of, of all these YouTube videos with between those two, is people keep on asking, well, why wouldn't I just hook up a PC? Why wouldn't I just hook up a PC? Mm -hmm. And I keep on thinking, because there are things that are in this that are not available on the Steam version, are not available on the Switch version, and it's particularly that table view. Mm -hmm. I really want to see 
a side-by-side -side comparison of what that table view looks like and what cabinet view via PC looks like so that we can mm -hmm. highlight the differences and maybe and spot if there were graphical improvements or not, which we've heard rumor, but we don't know. Yeah. Then you've got the reviews coming in for at games uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, Legends pinball. So once again, uh, Doug, he actually paid for his and got it sent $100 it was in wave shipping. in one. $100 yeah. shipping. Youch. Um, I know that uh, uh, P-Dub's got one. And then there was a couple of fringe, uh, like I was just starting seeing videos pop up on, on YouTube. So I started yeah, watching just some of those. actual customers, essentially, just getting them. Yeah, and yeah. doing their own reviews. Because there's yeah. like they, they're doing them in waves at the moment. So you're getting like a wave one, wave two. And there's yeah. some actual customers that got into wave one. So those are probably the reviews that I'm referencing the most uh, with what I'm about to say. So and, these are not the, uh, the content creator reviews. These are the individual people reviews. Yeah, well, because I was watching those. In, I was waiting for Doug's review to, to happen. And in the meantime, I started watching these other ones um, yeah, right. just to see what people were saying. And some of the wild things that I was hearing were just like, really? And the, and the this is what gets me the most. It just kind of frustrates me. Where you can clearly tell this is the first time these people have ever seen essentially pinball arcade mm -hmm. being played. They've never... One guy admitted... I've never played virtual pinball. I only play real pinball, but I like the the idea of this machine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, oh God, this review is going to suck. So hardware-wise, everybody seems to like the hardware. And, and I don't think... Yeah. You wouldn't be surprised by that. No, it, it seems perfectly reasonable. The hardware seems great. Yeah. Like the at games, like they, they've got... The right idea there, I think. Yeah, and I've said that in the past. Like if I, if I had to spend the six hundred dollars, I'd, I'd probably take a risk and actually get the at games because I think they they've got the right idea. Yeah. Um, but something that drives me bonkers. So okay, so software wise, and again, a lot of what drives me bonkers is you start reading the comments and you realize that if the person had done a proper review of the software, these comments wouldn't be existing. Um, mm -hmm. But pointing out. Gee, it seems floaty. Or why is the ball oblong? Um, at you know, at, <laughs> yes. at various points. To which I again, I really want to see a screenshot of a top-down view of it because I'm almost positive this is a port of the uh, Arcuda okay, yeah. version of the software. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was really evident about that was as you went towards the top of the play field, round objects became oblong. Or because oblong. of the perspective shift with and that's the just connect, it. It, right? Well, what it is, and I, and I realize this is, you know, when you come to a, a traffic stop and the word stop is written on the road, it looks mm. fine when you're in your car. If so you looked you look at, at that backwards. thing from over top, it looks funky. Because yeah, it's, it's that super whole, long. Right, it's that whole stretched perspective. So if the table mm. is lying flat and you're standing here and you're looking at it, it's going to look good because the optical illusion works that's how they've done the art yeah yeah it's a it, what do they call it? the uh, parallax view I, th I think yeah i think so something like that yeah um but so it's they do it on stadiums I... all the time right like they you do... see it on all, all the um grass signage on on sports fields it's the oh, same yeah. thing yeah 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 um so it's like it's one of those things that, again i want to confirm it for myself and know but also why is nobody pointing it out while they're playing it why is you know when you're looking at mm -hmm. these things why aren't you saying, you know, and just to be like, it's a, you know, reading the bullet points of it's a 1080p monitor. It's running at 60 frames per second. This is genius. It's like, well, well that's yeah, just from the box, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Like, like, that's nothing new. Like, no one really cares about reading stats from a box. Like, right. they can get that from the website. Right. What they want to know is they want to know how is the software. And the thing is that from people who have never, literally never played pinball arcade before they'll be they'll be getting the the shiny factor right right well so, i was thinking about it and i was like it'd be almost like well yeah i really like watching movies at home yeah it's great oh you're gonna go send me to a movie oh and it's gonna be in 3d wow and then you watch this 3d movie and you're watching and, and i'm just gonna go way old school here to one that's yeah. noticeably everybody knew was bad 
you're watching Clash of the Titans and thinking, wow, 3D is amazing, having never seen Avatar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. you not knowing all the things that you should be looking at that are like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and that's wrong. <laughs> yeah. And it's just comes to, it's comes down to familiarity. And unfortunately, you and I have a lot of familiarity with, with Farsight products. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we know, well, I could pretty confidently say this, we know everything about that software. And like, what to not, look for. <laughs> it's not a small post. We really do. So, like, we... <laughs> We've been following it ever since, like they started slapping their software in all these cabinets. Eight it years, is... Jared. We've been at this for eight years. Yeah, and you know that nothing has changed in that build that they're slapping on all of these cabinets, particularly as it's the Android build. Um, and well, then, the and then, then, old... then you start hearing people, and and this is what I want to kind of point out: it's helpful to identify issues with the software so mm. that you can demand better and ask that these things get corrected because yeah. if all you're doing is heaping praise on it, then there's no reason why it's ever going to get adjusted. Thanks. And so I see a lot of, uh, again, a lot of the comments is, is like, Oh, well, you know, yeah, the back glass, the score is really teeny tiny because you're showing And We pointed this out when we were first looking at the image of the 15 and a half monitor with, you've got the entire back glass and then the score. And if you know, godly mm. premier, tables even in person that score display was teeny tiny it's now cool. shrink it down even more it's going to be microscopic practically legible yeah yeah and are there ways of blowing up the image and doing all that yeah that's up to you but it would be much better if arcuda went to farsight and said hey make this a quick hit button so that it automatically pops this way in case somebody wants it not that they have to pause the game go into the settings reframe the sizing oh, for, they've got, you know they've got a number of buttons on the front of that cabinet they could probably in-game repurpose one to actually like control the dmd display right right, right. that would uh, be a good quality of life improvement for the um the software but we're talking about like farsight here who just doesn't seem to care about that well the farsight's um, a contract player they they were contracted for the software they deliver the software they delivered. the software went live the software has been shipped there's going to be basic support for making sure the software doesn't crash. But if you want improvements, guess what? New contract. You pay that. <laughs> or you got to pay more. Yeah. Right. Right. This this was the this is essentially the the ship build that you agreed upon in, in the contract. Or more likely, this is the shipped build that you were told you were getting <laughs> in the contract. And and, and I would just point it. out Stern Pimble Arcade as a classic example. Stern Pinball mm -hmm. Arcade on PC, the interface is verging on unusable. It's it is terrible. Really, it is yeah. absolutely just probably dog shit. the worst. And this is this is and dog shit's a polite way of putting it, Chris. Like well, it we're is, a polite show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is. It is the worst software interface I have ever used in a PC game. It is that bad. And now, that's conversely. When they put it out on the Switch, they made massive improvements that made the interface really, really better. Good. In really so much many better. ways. And I was like, oh, so we're going to be getting this on PC, aren't we? No. Nope. Nope. And why? Because that wasn't the contract. <laughs> that wasn't the contract. It would cost them extra money to do it. And, yeah, jeez. So um, the other thing that the other thing that was popping up with these reviews, and I, again, I'll send you over to uh, Retro Ralph's direction. He did a whole breakdown on the difference between solenoids and transducers, uh, uh, which yes. are essentially speakers, right? Yeah. And the best way that I can almost equate it to, after talking to him uh, via messaging and stuff, so in my cabinet here. I have Xbox 360 rumble motors. Yep. Now, although they're not speakers, they still work in waves, right? Just like a yeah. speaker would. Yes. It can feel, you can feel the rumble and you yeah. can feel the vibration, but it's not a hit no, it's like a, a solenoid build up, does. build down. It's a wave. So right. you've got this sweeping pattern, right? Yeah. Right. And I got to believe, so when people are asking, what's the difference between solenoid and a transducer? I got to believe that's the difference of the sensation. It's not that the rumble doesn't work with 
the the ad games cabinet that it can't work and that it's going to feel false no it, may, it might feel perfectly fine what's interesting when you look at the underside um i think i think doug is the one that showed the underside um they carved out the wood and that speaker is right up against the plastic underneath your hands so it's, oh it, it, i mean right it's, where that at games they, panel is with the control panel on. Yeah, they pretty much, it looks like, are putting that speaker through as thin of a material as possible to be vibrating on your hand um, to right. get that sensation. So you're basically having all the, it's basically like essentially turning the speakers up to 10 and having that all in your face rather than having a nice balanced array of speakers around you delivering subtle differences in vibration and tone. Well, and the, the reason why I think they did it is because again, the rumble book in there going through three quarter inch MDF wood. I, it's hard to feel that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, yeah. it it doesn't. Uh, you um, could probably do it if you put big stonking speakers in there, but we're talking about building materials. Here I actually asked Ralph if he thought of a way that I could put because uh, he he wound up doing an entire uh, episode, and it was putting this subwoofer like one in there in in the mm. into the arcade one up cab. Mm -hmm. which he said it basically got obnoxiously loud <laughs> um, <laughs> but but that it that it, it that it worked really well for him and i was like i wonder if i could put if i it would be do good to put something like that in here unfortunately everything is controller based it's not audio based um yeah so i, I but i'm like that'd be kind of cool to be able to <laughs> you need to run it. Uh, you basically need to connect it up to you your card and your computer, your sound card, and your computer, and run the sound through there with a pass-through headphone adapter or something. Oh. So you're actually, like, you'd, you could do it, but it'd be a bit of a trip. It'd be more wires. It'd be to more connect wires. I don't want more wires. No, you've already got enough barriers to wanting to plug that thing in and play pinball on anyhow. Right. So you know. Yeah. Right. And then, and then one of the one of these also mentioned. <laughs> this is the biggest bunch of BS, I believe. Uh -huh. That. Solenoids would wear out after a, in, in less than a year if you were doing daily play. What? So, so let me get this straight. So somebody said out there that solenoids are going to die after a year. Based on what evidence? Um, based off of apparent life cycles of solenoids based off of a, a, a sheet of paper that gave stats, I think. Uh, so when we're looking at solenoids that are not flipper mechanisms um, in arcade machines. Think of the solenoids that you use in the Namco point bank guns, right? Now, those things, if you've ever had one of those guns apart, which I have, um, they are a very different solenoid to what you get in a um, pinball machine. They are, <laughs> they're basically all hold winding, um, they are very large for what they do. Um, and the mechanism in them is such that they don't have the problem with um, the, the, the backstop in the coil. The backstop and the, the plunger end on a coil is the thing that will make a solenoid fail and seize up because of the burring of the end of the rod. This thing's basically a slide through rod with the stop at the end of the solenoid so very again if you haven't looked inside the pinball machine you won't know what i'm talking about but it looks very much like a match solenoid that just pops up drops down has no bottom to it um, or has a soft bottom with like a, a rubber ring at the bottom so as far as things that will actually wear out on this the only thing that's going to wear out is maybe the the rubber bit at the end where it goes back to rest like these solenoids well, these, are designed these... to fire and fire and fire and not die because these are uh, again ralph showed it it's a little box he popped open the cover and oh, yeah. and you know it is firing and it is hitting a stop at the end yeah yep. you know to, that's what's making the the thwack yeah. um you know it's not a giant coil or anything it's, it's obviously no, some it's... other mechanism i don't need to be big no like no. So what you're talking about, so my assumption is correct in that it's not like a, a regular flipper coil with a backstop. It's like a it's like a traveling pin basically with a spring load on it. I should see if I can look it up. 
and and find mm. it find it for you. Because I mean, it, this is this is generally how that type of solenoid works. Like the like the ones that are designed to actuate something, they have a backstop on them because they need a backstop. The backstop is the stop that or the rest position for the coil. So for those ones that need to stop at a particular point and then travel to a particular point, that's why you have backstops on them, like flippers um, and uh, things like diverter ramps and stuff like that with a definite like sort of engaged and disengaged position. Mm -hmm. But things like feedback solenoids like this, match solenoids are the same. Um, they don't need that. They just need to activate, make a whack noise or like hit a thing and then drop. You'll find the same mechanism. Well, this isn't technically true, but um, because pop bumpers do technically have a, a stop point in them in the bracket, but um, they work in a similar way. But um, they're, I guess, pop bumper solenoids uh, and mechanisms are a little bit like a flipper because they have a definite stop point. Otherwise, the ring would just continue through the play field and you'd get some problems. So, yeah, match solenoids and stuff like that, they. Um, they don't need a stop point. And that's the point that wears out or makes the, the actual flipper rod wear out. So I'm calling bull crap on a solenoid wearing out after a year, yeah, um, I'm, frankly. I'm getting it up right here. Let's see. Ah, oh, here we go. Here's a good... I'm going to share my screen here with you and uh, you'll be able to take a look. Ah! Ralph, yes, we're using your video. Sorry. Um, there it is. So the solenoid is there at the bottom that is in the arcade one-up cab. And you can see the little bracket that it hits up against to give yes. the thwack. Yes. And you'll see that at the end, there is basically no stop on it. It's just a um, a coil with a little split ring on it that retains a spring in place. And the essentially, the backstop is at the front rather than the back. The backstop is that bracket that you see hitting um, up against the, the front of the coil. So there's not going to be any problems with that particular actuator burring up inside the um the coil body which is that rectangular metal body there mm -hmm. um so th i don't see why that wouldn't last for longer than a year and what we do know is even if the person claiming that this is a fact is is right and this lasts for less than a year mel has already confirmed that it's very easy to get in there and switch things out could you switch back to that picture again Chris? Oh, i closed it <laughs> okay. I was um, I was a little over eager. So, <laughs> so there'll be a way that those things are connected inside the cabinet, and you can guarantee it's just going to be a plug, like a, a Molex plug or something similar. So if it dies, unplug it, screw another one in, you've got another allegedly year of enjoyment out but of the Even solenoid. still, I can't believe that it would only last a year. I mean, that's not if that was the case, you wouldn't be finding 30, 35 year old pinball machines with original solenoids still functioning no no well you wouldn't because well the thing is that those those machines you know the, the solenoids in them they you, you need to maintain them obviously as we sure. all know with pinball so you know they will they do have disposable parts in them they are the coil uh, the coil end brackets and the um and the Sleeve. rods mm -hmm. and sleeves now, they're really the things you need to replace at all times with pinball machines but these these solid state these are essentially like solid state solenoids yeah um in fact that they've got like they're designed for repetitive use and they're not designed like a flipper mechanism which is it's designed to wear because of the way it's designed i uh, use design way too much then um <laughs> <laughs> but like looking at that picture that you showed like these things are essentially like a a dedicated purpose-built solenoid actuator they're not actually a solenoid traditional solenoid they're actually an actuator so they're built in a different way they function in a different way through a regular solenoid so they're designed to be used over and over again and cycle over and over again and if you have a look at the side the, the reason why i was going to say you have a look at the size of those solenoids if they're going if rk one up announce at ces that they're going to be doing more gun shooting games which you could probably expect they will because they seem to be really popular you can expect to see that package, that solenoid package, inside a point blank gun, uh, or that package inside a time crisis gun, right? Because that's what they're going to be using to give that tack 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 feedback. You won't mm -hmm. see the slide mechanism like you see on the Namco guns because they're really expensive, um, but you will feel that tack 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 feedback inside yeah. the gun, and that solenoid is going to be what's delivering that. But it's going to be redesigned. It won't be in a big box. 
it will be just in the the actual slide of the gun because it's small enough to be inside the slide of the gun so that's my call there that's what they're going to be using inside their light guns in the future so my call to well basically to the two reviewers that i know that that uh, are your bigger named p dubs dug it cool toy do me a favor please please Focus on the software for a moment. Do some comparing between that software that is in your Ant Games cab and the software that is available through Steam. Pinball Arcade. Because um, I'm not going to have an Ant Games cabinet. It's just not going to. It's not in my no. budget at all. Um, so, but I really want to know. I want to. I want a review that's purely about the software and the differences and why it would make more sense or why you would want to have that in Ant Games. How is an improvement over just playing Steam. The, the standard or version? Or Android. Yeah. Um, especially since, I mean, because I can put Pinball Arcade into cabinet mode, or not cabinet mode, but into vertical screen mode. It's not the Arcuda mm. mode, which some people were able to buy the or, or, and have bought the Arcuda software and are playing mm. that in cabinet mode. So that's why I want to know. Is it just a port of the Arcuda software? Is it somehow different? The only way to know that is by comparing screenshots. So... <laughs> The only way you're going to find out whether it's a port of the Akuda cabinet is to have someone who actually knows what the Akuda build looks like <laughs> play it <laughs> because, you know, otherwise they're not going to be knowing what they're looking for. Yeah, so you got a point there too. All right, let's move on. Um, something else that I. Uh... Look, I spent a lot of time watching YouTube over the holiday. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And I kind of stumbled across something that I went, ooh, wait a second. And I think I'd known about it in the back of my head, but I'd never actually watched it in practice and being, mm -hmm. being done. And that is these things called hardtops for actual pinball machines. Oh, yeah. You know about the hardtops. I do. So for those that don't know about hardtops, hardtop is basically a one thirty seconds of an inch piece of plastic that has all the art printed on it from your particular cabinet. And it's got an adhesive on the back, and you stick that thing down on top of your playfield, and have a perfectly glass smooth surface, perfect cabinet art. Um, the adhesive is not going to be moving around on your, uh, you know, at all, and give you lots of life to this. And it is it's costing basically like doing a full playfield restoration, but without having to do the art touch up. Exactly, without thing. having to do the art touch ups, and for a fraction of the price of buying a uh, CPR brand new playfield, brand new playfield, which is mm. usually going to run you about eight hundred, eight hundred fifty bucks. Uh, yeah. These are going to run you. Uh, I'm looking at the site right now, three hundred fifteen to three hundred twenty five for them. Mm. Um, so of course, I went to their website and decided to look up. The two tables that I have, because, and I've never shown this on on the, the podcast, mm. but I've got my firepower, right? Yeah. And I have the playfield right here, folks. Yeah. So I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, of what I'm dealing with. One second. Let's flip this over to Jared so that we can do a more surprise reveal. <laughs> mm. Oh, we, for those who know firepower, it's got a very busy planet in the middle of it. Oh, don't mind and, that was just noise. well, it's sort of, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of a dog to try and repair. It's I'm so detailed a, in the middle there. Just a little bit. So let me get my microphone up here. So that, because I got to be able to stand and, and do this. All right, here we go. You ready? Yeah. There's firepower. And yeah. as is usual, oh man, I got the wires coming in. As is usual, the middle of the playfield gets rather hammered. hammered. And that is not the easiest paint job in the world to try and replace. And if you'll notice, my upper area is really oh, it's hammered. hammered. Oh, it's hammered. Part yeah. of that is my doing because I needed to smooth out the inserts and repaint the red lasers. And yeah. uh, if we keep on going down, now you'll notice I have nice bright white because I have done painting on this. 
Yes, that's the first thing I do when I get a play field. I did all I... of that white around the pop bumpers. I redid all the lettering um, in a nice bright white. So yeah, that looks really good. You know, so I've done quite a bit of work on it. Uh, you know, but if these black areas with the, the wood showing, that is an absolute mess. Um, oh it's God, pretty... you should see my you should <laughs> see my Force Two play field, Chris. Like I've had to do some touch up on that for because it was down to bare wood in a fair few places. And uh, I can't color match, and I, I I got something that was as close, close as possible to the blue that I thought it was, and it wasn't really quite right. But I went, you know what? I'm going with it. And yeah. so this is the new blue. <laughs> it's so, on the play field. So I've done a lot of a lot of work on it, but I've also gotten to the point where I'm just like, okay, do I just put on the final coat of clear? Because I've cleared it, sanded, cleared, and then done the painting, and then cleared that. And yeah. then I put on water, uh, water slide decals. They didn't go down all that great. There was a little bit of mm -hmm. bubbling. I don't think the clear was going to make them nice and clear. So mm -hmm. now I'm contemplating peeling all those and hand lettering. Oh man, all that's the inserts. Not easy. Like um, I'm looking at particularly that <laughs> font, which is like a a digital number font on. It is a thing. digital number font. Um, I mean, I'm confident in my form. I'm confident in my abilities to be able to do that if I can use a paint pen. To which, yeah. if anybody out there has done paint pens, um, let me know what you used. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I've heard some people using acrylic. I've heard some people using uh, oil based, and I don't know which. It is... depends on what your top coat's going to be. So, what are you using on your top coat? It's going to be two part auto clear. Okay, then you don't use acrylic. <laughs> you use enamel yeah. paints. Oh. Uh, you don't mix. You don't mix um, um, oil with water because it doesn't mix. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to get uh, crazing, bubbling, and all sorts of bad stuff happening right. if you do. Right. So you and stick I, with I the don't one. Want any of that. So this is once again, I got to the stalling point. You know what the biggest stall is? Is I don't want to have to. Uh, I don't want to put the wiring harness back on. Oh yeah, it scares yeah, that's me beyond a... belief that it just sits there. I've got it on a piece of cardboard, all you know, like how they told you to just slide off, put it over to the side. It's quote unquote easy, you know, if easy you, to do. It. Yeah, and and I watch these repair not... videos of what people do, and and I just go, yeah, it's easy to do if you've been doing this a while and you can identify parts just like that. Whereas me, I'm going to be like, uh, what is that? <laughs> Particularly as you haven't done it for like two years. Uh, um, longer. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm I'm even having that trouble with the force two that I've got. I haven't I haven't like depopulated. I've depopulated the top of the playfield so I can actually do the art touch ups on it, and okay. you know, eventually run my um uh, super cheap auto um color spec over the top. Uh, my I cyanate free stuff. Um, but like it, uh, it's been a while, and it's been over a year since I depopulated the playfield. So I'm going to be piecing this thing back just based on the size of the wire forms and stuff like that when I get right. back and doing it. I, I, I did take pictures, but they're a year ago. I'm going to have to go all the way back in my photo album for a year ago and try and find them. And you I know, didn't it's... baggy things the way that you're supposed to baggy them. And, you know, the hard... It, 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 there's, there's a lot of headache that's going to come with that. But yeah. here's the thing. I feel like with my painting that I'm I'm close. And, it looks pretty good. And, like, it's what I call player condition at the moment. Right. And if I did get enamel paints and did a job on it, um, obviously it's not going to look perfect. Mm. And, uh, you know... But it's going to look better than bare wood, let's be serious. Right, right. But it's going to have like some said, color on them. Yeah. But then, like I said, I started watching these hardtop videos. So... Here's the hardtop website, and look at that. They have firepower, and Ooh. look at how vibrant all of those colors are looking. It's just like it looks so, it looks so different to oh. yours because it doesn't have all the fade on it. From right, it doesn't light. have the yellowing. Mm. Um, it's it's the true colors. That black, you know, is nice and black. It it's is black. gloss shiny. So shiny, yeah. So shiny. And the what people have been saying is that it um, they've never the, the thing has never played that way when the, you know when they're done it, 
the ball is almost too slick and too yeah. too fast on it. But on a table like Firepower, that's kind of the whole point. Um, yeah, it's it's not bad to have it like that because, right. well, the, the flippers and everything on that table, they're not strong. I've played one in real life. And even with brand new flippers and assemblies and everything, yeah, having a hard time getting out the top. Right. Like, it's not easy. So the advantage is I don't have any ramps on this because apparently no. if you have ramps, you got to account for that 30 seconds of an inch height difference and it throws off all the geometry of everything. You have to do micro adjustments on everything to like even oh, on scoops. Yeah, because even on scoops where it's shooting out, you think about the, the clearance tolerances. If it's just that much smaller, the ball might start hooking as it's coming up and oh. launching. Again, I don't have any of that on firepower so it's not an issue yeah. for me so that would be easy here's where it gets scary <laughs> in order for you to get the best surface possible you gotta shave off all that paint chris oh, oh you shave it down to the wood you make yeah, that it's, thing it's, it's, as it's, smooth it's, as possible with an orbital sander so that every single insert is exactly the same level it's the entire oh, yeah. thing you're starting with bare wood yeah it's basically a white wood yeah, you, you've got yourself a white wood, so you either do it or you do it, <laughs> basically. Which is just why I'm like, oh my god, do I go that route or do I just try and finish this? And I'm almost thinking of just finishing this up and and being being good with this one being what it is, because I don't necessarily know that uh, this is a table that I will keep um, well look, i put it this way for the long run if you were not going to keep the table i would i would do it on this one if i were I'd, not going I'd, to keep the table yes if you were not going to keep the table yeah but i don't want to invest the money in something that i'm just going to ditch what you'll be able to sell it for a lot more if you do like if it's got a really good play field on it and i mean you, you're doing all the work on the mechanicals and everything like that. You As sell a it. First timer. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it will will it flip? Yes. Yeah. Will the playfield look brand new? That's gonna add in this market that we're in at the moment. Well, well I'm speaking from Australia's perspective. Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous the prices they're asking for pinball at the moment. Um, but you know, you you probably need to like like with anything, look at your cost of restoring, which you know you don't want to look at because it's 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 horrible to think of how much it would right. cost to actually restore a pinball. But like on the raw parts alone, like how far are you in? What would adding this to the the build cost and what would the final price you could command be? Because you know, everyone knows that firepower has junk play fields if they're not restored because of the problem with the the, the center planet. So mm. if you can offer one that's basically completely factory fresh brand new play field you're gonna have a good time because something else i have to factor in i don't have the right soundboard i have to buy a whole new soundboard um if i want to have the the, because i don't have speech on mine all i've got is the the sounds um oh right right oh because you don't have the talk and talk right because somebody had put the wrong you know had swapped that out and replaced it um you know, the back sure glass, is, the back glass is pretty back. good, but it's not pristine. So that's why I'm that's what I'm saying is if I'm gonna if you put down this beautiful, beautiful play field, play field. and everything else on it is still just standard, like my plastics are a mess. Um, I would need to uh, buy all new yeah. CPR plastics. See what I'm saying? Okay, well, putting it that way, yeah, don't invest the money. But right. you've got another table in the wings there, don't you, Chris? What I about that do. One? And so my other table, and gee, look what they have. They have it also. I have an 8-Ball eight eight ball Deluxe. Deluxe. And the problem with my 8-Ball Deluxe is all down here. All oh, my cue balls, balls have massive, well, I shouldn't say massive, but a lot of cracking. <laughs> in it. Oh, right. They've got a lot they of... They feel so smooth, but obviously the dirt has gotten into that, and so it's a mess down there, and there's no way I would bother repainting that. No. Um It's too hard to color match as well. Yeah, the the rest it's of the play field that I have is, is pretty decent. My plastics are pretty good on this, especially okay. since this is the table that my friend uh, laser cut me new clear plastics that all go along this edge here and I'll go along this edge. So my plastics are actually quite good. Okay. Uh, so this is the one you do it on. This is the one that I'm thinking that I would yeah. do it on if I were going to do it. But again, it comes back to, do I have the guts to depopulate well, the play field and sand it? 
<laughs> well, look, I, I know for a fact that I've seen I've seen Ed at um, the uh, the pinball shack here in Brisbane do it, yep. and and he's had a lot of success with the hard tops. Like he said, lining them up isn't as hard as you think because no. they give you very good instructions to actually do it. So, providing you've done the work and you've really given that playfield a good level sanding, um, it's going to be fine to yeah. do it. But you've really got to put that work in. Like, you've got to put the work into the playfield and really, really get in there with a orbital well, sander or like a mouse sander. I just know before I can even think about it, I gotta, I, I actually have to finish firepower. <laughs> yeah, do that first. Get it flipping. Um, but you know. But I am um, curious if anybody, if, if if any of you out there have dealt with uh, painting on playfields, uh, again, if you know of a particular brand of ink pen or paint pen um, that has the colors of fiber, I mean, basically, I'm only looking for it's, they're probably married colors. It's I need a purple, a green, a blue, and a yellow, and a, and a good black um, mm. that I'm going to be dealing with. Um, you know, if it's something that you're able to buy off of Amazon or if I just go over to Michael's and, you know, buy from there. Um, just curious to know what people actually use. Because um, mm. I've seen some videos where guys are doing exactly that with paint pens, but they blast so fast through what they're using that I can't identify it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I always have a problem with that too here because usually the brands that they use over in America, we can't get here. So... We're flying blind as far as yeah. what we can actually get over here from a paint pen perspective. Yeah. I've got some, I've got some paint pens here as well, just just black white, um, and that's it. Um, I have some, I actually have sharpies, and I have used sharpies on um, some of the Gottlieb lenses, like Playfield lenses, mm. to re put on the scores. I'm gonna have to do that on um, Force Two because. I've had to pop out some of the lenses on Force 2 because they, they were just so bad. But see, I heard that if so, you put clear coat over the top of Sharpie, it just goes... <laughs> um, I did it on... Uh, I did it using the clear coat solution from Super Cheap over yeah. here. It didn't do that oh, okay. at all. So it was actually all right. Okay. And, then, and I will say that with the... So after, like, with doing the, the hard top, after they sand the entire play field... Um, you got to spray clear on that, and then you got to polish yes. up your uh, all your inserts, um, mm. and and get them. Actually, you probably polish them up first, and then put the clear. I imagine. <laughs> um, but you do put a you do put a, a coat of clear down, and then you put the hard top on top of that. Because uh, the I imagine there's two methods of putting hard top down. You can float it, or you can just go hardcore and just put it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, putting the clear over the top would allow you to float it. But like I was noticing, the guys that were doing, they were just using rattle can clear, so it wasn't. Oh, yeah. doing the, it wasn't doing you just the whole. Need to steal the playfield basically. It just yeah. needs to have a gloss surface so the adhesive can stick to it really well. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I was like, okay, good. So I wouldn't have to deal with the the two part auto spray, which is that's right, a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, all right. I actually watched a video on on the subject of restoration really quickly. I watched the. There's this really, really top quality restorer here in Australia um, who does it. And he used to go by the name of Savage Restorations. He's recently changed his name to his actual name. And he went through the process of what he does to actually clear and restore a play field. So I won't go into the literally 15 steps or more he does when he's doing restoration, but Ooh. he's essentially putting down like six layers of clear like if he's doing like a play field that's completely stripped back um he will put about four layers of clear down just to seal the bare wood on the play field hmm. and that's to so it will soak into any of the the plank lines that are in in the play field then he'll he'll sand that down to like beautiful like you know using a thousand grit yeah get it really nice flat and then he will put on six coats of automotive clear and with five minute intervals between each coat. Okay. Then he will let that cure. Then he will do any art touch up. Then he will put another six coats of clear down on top of this thing and let that cure. And then he will do the polishing and everything like that. So he's laying down 12 layers approximately of clear on these play fields. And if you've ever seen the end quality of where he posted to Facebook, 
these play fields are glass. They are incredible. Not only that, but they're going to have a depth to them. Oh, they just look beautiful. They look way better than the originals. Like he is an absolute artisan when it comes to play field yeah. restoration. And I go, okay, so if you're using 12 coats of clear, essentially, on your play fields, I am really skimping on the amount of clear I'm putting down the play field. So I'm going to try it this time with Force 2. When I'm at the point where I'm going to clear it, yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to go through probably about three rattle cans of color spec to do it. Um, but I'm going to do what he does. I'm going to put six coats down, five minute intervals between each one. And I'm going to see what this thing looks like compared to Star Race, which looked pretty good at the end of it. I will say the one thing that one of the guys pointed out, uh, and he said he learned the hard way after clearing it, he had to strip the entire play field again and start from scratch. <laughs> because what really? happened was he had a large insert with a decal on it, mm -hmm. and he laid the clear coat down heavy. Mm -hmm. And that wound up pulling, you know, the surface tension pulled and totally distorted the uh the the lens and the and the decal oh uh, i did it of it or, or not it wasn't the decal no it was just the lens anyway it pulled and so it looked like it had cracks in it even though it didn't and so what he had to oh. do what he discovered was you just put a really light flash coat uh, oh, yeah. clear down let that cure yeah and then and you really put your regular coats down because now it has an uh it's the same surface that it's you know pulling on it's that whole surface so it's clear it. rather than having clear with or you know wood plastic wood plastic it now is universally a base layer of clear and so yep. everything can shrink and pull at the same at the same level that's a good tip so do like maybe two coats of clear and then just leave it and it's it's literally yeah. a it's literally a dusting it's like a just a quick <laughs> just enough so that it's dusted on there Oh, Let yeah. that sit for a day and cure, and then go in and do your yeah every five minute and build it mm, up and, you know, kind of uh, kind of stuff. Yeah, good tip. Yeah. So. All right. Mm. Who knew that we were going to talk real pinball? We don't talk real pinball here, do we, Jared? Oh, sometimes we do. Yeah, sometimes when, we do. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's pinball, so we're going to talk about it. Right. Like, you know, it's fun. Let's 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 dip into the other subject that uh, is the annual tradition here that or my annual tradition. Jared just gets to listen. Mm. <laughs> that we teased last time. That is, yeah, every year I make a list of all the movies that I watched throughout the entire year. And these are, the list is only of things that are brand new to me first time watching in that given year. So it might be a slightly older movie, but if it's the first time I've seen it, then it goes onto the list. And so this year, Jared, I actually watched 86 movies. 86? In a pandemic 2020 lockdown period. That's pretty impressive. Of which only one did I see in the movie theater, which is right. sad. <laughs> and, yeah. and more than, and you may think, oh yeah, well I saw a movie in the theater, you know, back when, no, I saw it in November. Right. <laughs> Cause I right. really wanted to see Tenet in the theater. So I saw Tenet in the yeah, theater. Um, that was one you needed to see in the cinema for sure. So, uh, and of that of that list, sixteen of these movies were specifically made for Netflix. Netflix. Um, right. I watched eight documentaries. I don't watch documentaries. Uh, mm. So yeah, it was it was a different year for viewing. Um, yeah. So I always I always make my best list, and and it's not in any particular order typically. Um, and then I have a good list and a the worst list and a disappointing list. There's all sorts of lists that I break this down by. But I do got to say, of my best list, usually at least three or four are movies that I will add to my collection of movies right. via physical copy. This year? Okay. None. None. And it really bums me out. It's like all the movies I was most looking forward to got pushed. Um mm. So we just need that 2020 B that we're talking about that's, earlier in the that's show. That's what right? I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just rattle these off real quick. I don't know how many of these you've actually seen, Jared, but uh, I'll on, if I do. On my best list, I have Yesterday, which was that mm -hmm. Beatles Groundhog Day, basically, where the guy wakes up, or he doesn't wake up, but everybody has forgotten who the Beatles are except for. Him. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What well, was a good, good movie? Yeah, no, it's, yeah? it's, it's a very it satisfying. Um, like it's it's not Groundhog Day, it's not time travel, but it kind of touches upon some of those things, and it 
uh, I don't know. It, I'd it, imagine it's like I'm just getting my notebook out so I can make some uh, yeah. some little notes about what I should yes. be adding to my um, watch queue. So yesterday, it's almost like when I was watching, it's like it's like you go back in time and then you know everything, exactly. and you know that you, basically you are the you're doing what the uh, the group that you idolize do, and you're writing all their songs and. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's like not time everything. travel, but it is if you went back in time with all the knowledge that you know today and gave everybody that knowledge 50 years earlier. Yeah, essentially, like let's let's give everyone the iPhone 30 years in the in the past, in the past, in the past. Yeah, yeah. yeah when everybody yeah. else is rocking their Nico Nokia 9600s. Nokia. Um, yeah, yeah. You got your touchscreen phone. Yeah. All right. That's so cool. there was that. These are basically listed in the order that I saw them. Let's put it to you that okay. way. Not what's mm -hmm. best. Um, Ford versus Ferrari. Which oh, is, yeah. uh, if you're at all into racing or car culture, it's pretty dang good. Um, and then there's uh, Jojo Rabbit, which is one of those where it's amazing when you can make Hitler and World War II funny without being sympathetic. Like, without saying, oh, and it's all okay. No, it's still poignant. It's still pointed and aimed squarely at what was wrong with the situation, but it's also yeah. very absurdist humor. Um, oh, okay. Right. Cool. Add uh, it to the list. <laughs> I, I've got this uh, documentary called The Painter and the Thief, which is crazy in that it's this gal has her, the epitome of her life's work on display in a gallery of paintings and the, the you know what she considers her masterpiece, her best work, uh, sitting in the window and it gets stolen. Oh, no. And it is caught on camera and they're actually able to find who stole it. And she could care less about prosecuting the guy. She just wants her painting back. But he was so high that he has... He barely remembers that he even did the crime, <laughs> let alone where right. he stashed it. And yep. if he stashed it or if it had gotten sold... And while you'd normally think that the person would be like, well, he gets what he deserves, get out of my life, she actually invites him into her life and says, here's how you owe me. You're going to be my subject for painting now. Oh. And she winds up, he winds up be, almost becoming amused to her. She winds up painting him uh -huh. and he starts rehabilitating and it just like gives you all sorts of feels. Um, oh, right. like, it's like one of those where you go oh my god there is good in humanity um, right, man. hmm. Got uh, that. there is a one this one was uh, uh, my wife really liked it and I thought it was really quite good too uh, it's called Enola Holmes uh, was, Enola Holmes Enola Holmes Enola so it's Sherlock Holmes' little sister oh okay yeah yeah um, that's pretty dang that's good, good about that too. Yeah. Uh, there's Hamilton I don't Hamilton? do Broadway musicals I don't do musicals oh, where the entire yeah, thing yeah. is nothing but music. Damn good. <laughs> All right, Hamilton on the list. Um, there's Beastie Boys story. So oh yeah, Beastie Boys story is the two surviving members of the Beastie Boys up on stage, basically doing a "This is our life," starting from square one of when the Beasties formed, going all the way to present day, basically. And it's not a PowerPoint presentation, but it's kind of like a TED Talk. Um, oh, so yeah. Imagery cool. going on up above and stuff like that. And mm. gives you just an absolutely fascinating insight to their whole creative process and what was going on during any given album and you know what was going on in their lives and were they aware of the controversies that they were creating and were they buying into it or were they you know, self-aware and going, hee-hee, and letting it happen. I mean, it's yeah. quite... Quite good on that end. Um, plus, it's just. Do you need to be a fan, you reckon, of the Beastie Boys to get value out of it? I don't think you need to be a fan per se. I think you'll become a fan afterwards, mm. um, because you'll realize the variety of styles that were in their music. Um, yeah. I mean, if you only know them from, you know, their license to ill album, then you'll you'd be quite surprised at where they finish up, basically. Oh, um, cool. So that was uh, as a as a minor aside to that. If you like to see how creative processes with musicians um, happen, you should definitely tune into Song Exploder on Netflix. I um, just saw the one with uh, Nine Inch Nails, of course. 
Yeah. <laughs> so that's been a podcast I've been listening to for, geez, I think it's about three years now, longer probably. Mm-hmm. And it is such a good podcast. And yeah. the fact that Harishikesh Herway um, got the ability to turn this into a Netflix film is something that almost makes me want to go and get a Netflix subscription so I can watch it because he is very good at getting information out of artists about how they their creative processes right. and it's fascinating to hear yeah mm. and then the uh the last one that made my list and i was quite surprised that this made my list because i thought it was going to be just stupid dumb a movie called crawl 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 is basically about uh it takes place in florida a hurricane is happening Girl go uh, a daughter goes to check up on her dad at his house because he's one of these people that's like I'll ride out the storm and she's like you ain't riding <laughs> yeah. out this one and uh, gets into the house can't find him winds up finding him downstairs in the crawl space underneath the house trapped by an alligator trapped by an alligator yes okay there's a big beastly alligator that uh, washed into there and as the hurricane progresses flooding starts happening and yeah. the underside of the house starts filling up and as it fills up that gives the alligators more ability to maneuver and so go around it's an extra part is a little bit like that that terrible shark boy movie um um that was uh where the shark circles around the uh um the island what was it called i think you know the one i'm talking about right where the there was a swimmer she went out to oh the surfer with... yes i know which one yeah. i love that movie <laughs> Yeah, it was really suspenseful. It was and, where she's like floating on the she's floating on a whale, and then uh, and, and then, then the shark having to swim goes, over to a buoy and live on yeah, the yeah, buoy yeah. for a little while. Yeah, 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 yeah. The end of that movie is is implausible, but the but, rest of the movie but satisfying was, all the same. <laughs> satisfying all the same. Yeah, it was it was good. Yeah, I can't remember what the heck that one was. That one was, uh, the shallows, the shallows. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that was yeah. was that Blake Lively. I think it was. Could be. That's the girl. But yeah, it's, so it's similar in that vein in that you're stuck, you're trapped, and you've got nature. I thought it was going to be ridiculously stupid, and instead it was ridiculously tense. Um, oh, that's good. I'll done check that out. really well. Uh, you know, it's obviously a low budget movie, but they didn't. They hid the budget. You know, they didn't. They didn't it overextend. They didn't the do budget. dodgy CG. Um, it, it's it, just particle filmmaking at its best, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and then I was shocked to find out that the whole thing is filmed up in Canada, nowhere near water. Huh? Oh, there you go. <laughs> On a set, who would have thought? On a set, who would have thought? Okay, so those are those are the best ones, and you you're probably wondering, well, where the heck is Tenet, and why didn't it make your best list, Chris? Mm, um, yeah, noticeably absent there. Yeah, Tenet Tenet wound up making my good list. Um, look, it has really awesome action sequences. There's no doubt about that, and it's really good filmmaking. But the truth of the matter is I watched it a second time here at home with mm. subtitles on, hoping to clarify things. And truth be told, they just don't do a good job of explaining what it is you're actually watching. Uh, with subtitles on? Yeah, so I, put did the you English, have I put the English thing? subtitles on because this the movie has terrible sound design. There's a lot of talking, you know, like we're... Yeah, that's true. There's it was a lot a bit of muffled. muffled, and not only that, they use my subwoofer was getting a massive workout. The mm-hmm. low end frequency that it's constantly pumping, yeah, drowns out a lot of the voice. Ah, uh, that was a problem, right? Yeah. So they've sort of done the sound design a little bit wonky in it. Yes, and mm. Nolan has said you're just kind of supposed to feel, you know. It, it, you're supposed to feel the movie and understand it that way. And I do, you know, while the action sequences are playing, I do kind of get it, but I also want it to be like Inception where afterwards I can really have deep discussions about what the heck is going on because I yeah. understood how the process worked. And here the process is just labyrinthian. <laughs> it, I've, uh, this is one that I also went deliberately to see in the cinema. Um, and um knowing i didn't go in looking at any spoilers or like you know trying to understand the movie before when i went in cold and i enjoyed it at face value um i do have the opportunity to watch it again but i don't know if i will 
Yeah. Um, because I think the end, like the way that they, they describe the events in mean, the big scene at the end. Yeah. I kind of, it's essentially it kind of explains all the bits in the beginning for you. Anyhow, it doesn't leave you guessing a lot. There's not a lot to like really try and guess about, um, which was different to Inception because Inception really felt like you had to piece it together yourself. And that's why they had flow charts about how the three layers work and all that sort of stuff so you can understand it. This didn't really feel like you had to understand anything at the end of the movie, which I guess no, but is... What I want to understand is how does it actually work? <laughs> oh, so how does right the whole right. premise... And the of... how it works is never explained well. Um, Inception right. did a really good job of explaining the how it works. Yeah. Inception was all about chemical, like brain and chemical right. uh, yeah. control. But this yeah. is different. This is very much science fiction. Yeah. Um, so anyway, whereas, yeah, Tenet made the good list. Uh, other movies that made the good list, I'll just rattle through these real quick. Uh, Doctor Sleep, which is a sequel to uh, The Shining. Um, oh. Parasite, which was last year's best uh, picture. I think it was more hype than deserving. Um, 1917, uh, which was that basically single continuous World War movie, which, although I appreciate the technical aspect of it, after a while I was like, just put a cut in, please. Because <laughs> oh, it, it was like getting exhausting, was it? Well, it was suspending my disbelief of really all this is that close to each other? I don't think so. Um, then there was uh, Knives Out, which is, you know, if you're into that Agatha Christie kind of uh, thing, pretty dang good. Um, mm -hmm. Invisible Man, there was the first movie of the pandemic that I watched. And again, another movie where they did what they could with the best use of the budget that they had. Um, okay. And it wouldn't have gotten better with a bigger budget. So okay, that's so why. They, they spent right. Yeah. They invested it, the right amount of money. Exactly. <laughs> um, the Old Guard, that was a Netflix movie with uh, Charlize Theron. Uh, Trial of the Chicago 7, if you're into dialogue that's witty and snappy and you like Aaron Sorkin, there you go because he directed it. Um, okay. There's a uh, documentary called Boy State, which is uh, would be completely uninteresting to you, Jared. It's all of, I actually attended it as a, as a kid. Um, oh. It's basically high school juniors get sent to state capitals in each of the 50 states and play government for a week. Yeah, I've seen that on Apple TV+. Plus. It's a TV Plus subscription. Yes, thing, that's think. that's what I saw it on, and uh, it gave me PTSD. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the one that I... This falls into the similar category of Crawl, where it knows exactly what it is, which is a cheeseball B movie, but it does it really well. It's called Unhinged. It's with Russell Crowe. It's basically a really bad uh what happens when road rage goes bad but yeah I've saw, i saw that actually but being the floated this thing year. that i liked about it was something would happen and i'd start yelling at the screen going well if you would just do this and i'll be damned if the character didn't just do that and i went oh okay thank you <laughs> and then and then things still went wrong and i went okay but you know what at least you weren't an idiot <laughs> you tried yeah. <laughs> you know you gave it a go you gave yeah it a i go. saw that movie float around and i thought yeah, that almost looks like something you could get your popcorn out for and have a bit of fun It's with. totally popcorn. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and then, uh, da, 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 trying to see real quick here, I'm going to ignore the disappointing, and I'm going to go straight to, I don't know, do we need to talk about the worst? Um, no, let's not talk about the no, worst. Let's not I talk think about the worst. Let's go to what my, I know. The... We're going to go to my special awards. Yeah, I love these. Because I always do the special <laughs> awards. All right. Yeah, I love them. So here's the special awards. Um, and these don't change. These are the same special awards every year. It's just what movie fits into there. So movie mm -hmm. I knew would suck, but I watched it anyways. Gemini Man and The Dark Tower. Oh, all right. Um, Gemini Man being that Will Smith movie and The Dark Tower being that Stephen King adaption that they did not adapt well at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Avoid, in other words. Yes, avoid. Uh, movie I thought would suck but didn't. Well, Crawl. I already talked about that. And then I cool. just watched uh, The New Mutants, which is that uh, X-Men adjacent movie. It felt more like a TV pilot. Because um, yeah. it's, again, very small scale, small budget. But yeah. it worked for what it was. Okay. Um, 
Let's see. Movie I regret paying for. Well, the only movie I paid for this year was Tenet, so it wins by yeah. default. <laughs> so so you, you really didn't like it enough? No, it's that... just it's the only one that I paid for, so it, it wins by default. So to... Oh, really? Okay. Oh, okay. That's a tough one to have to put in. Because I don't... <laughs> I, well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know. Um, and then let's see what else we got here. We have, ah, yes, the Curse You Shaky Cam Award. Because there's, <laughs> there's nothing so much as, like watching a movie that's just doing this the entire time during action sequences oh, right. and, and cutting every three seconds. And, well, mm. it's not surprising. Like an MTV um, video. Yeah, and it's not surprising that a, a Michael Bay movie won this. It's uh, <laughs> Six Underground, which is just a load of crap. Right. Um, there's the Maybe I Just Don't Get It Award, and that would be going to Mank, which is the movie about uh, Mankiewicz, who wrote the screenplay for Citizen Kane. And unless you're a Citizen Kane junkie, uh, a lot of this is just going to go right over your head, and they don't do a good job of explaining all of it. They just assume you know all of it, and it's just kind of... It's not a bad movie. I mean, like, I found it watchable, but it's also just like, is this going to be over anytime soon? <laughs> like he's just watching the watching. Are uh, we, are we done? <laughs> yes. Uh, movie I'm glad I turned off less than 30 minutes into. Critter's Attack. I didn't last 10 minutes. It looked like what? a student production. Do you remember Critters the movie? Attack. Do you remember the movie Critters? Probably not. Vaguely. It was out right around the same time as Gremlins. Um, Gremlins. Yeah. Yes. And it was these mm. little tiny fur balls that were nasty and they came from outer space. Yeah, well, they made a direct-to-video movie just this last year called Critters Attack, and I swear it, like, student productions have more um, polish polish and quality to them. They went to a college campus and there wasn't a single extra walking around. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. There was no money on this one. Um, right. Movie I wished I turned off but didn't. The Hustle. The, the hustle. The hustle is uh, Rebel Wilson and uh, Anne Hathaway, and it's yeah. a remake of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I love right. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Unfortunately, they didn't change nearly anything, and I'm sorry, but Anne Hathaway is not Michael Caine. <laughs> oh yeah, she doesn't Michael come Caine off as smarmy. You need oh. it, just, it. Just didn't play. Um, mm. The well, that was depressing. Award that goes to Uncut Gems. That's the uh, Adam Sandler movie, uh, where okay. he plays a uh, a jeweler who has a massive gambling habit and is basically paying for one gambling debt while pulling out a loan for another gambling. <laughs> so while it was depressing, was it good? It was good. It's just a bummer of an ending. Oh, okay. Um, the, let's see, the You're Not a Franchiser Yet Award. Because there's nothing like watching a movie that then it ends and you go, really? So what was I watching? The prologue? (laughs) You don't have a sequel guaranteed, so stop it. Uh, This goes to a, (laughs) I don't blame the, a Chinese movie called Double World. Okay. That has all sorts of dubious effects and grand production value and apparently... It went, it was a victim of the pandemic and Netflix scooped it up. Right. Um, so it was about to die, but Netflix said, no, we'll take it. Yeah. They I have a habit of doing that, don't they? Like, they do rescue a lot of films, like uh, uh, the old series that, you know, commercial networks won't pick up, and yet they do amazingly well on Netflix. Yeah. Like the one so, with Chess. So this was, this was a movie that were literally, it was just. Apart from the fact that they, like, if you were a female character, yeah, you're dead. Um, right, okay. They were merciless on that. <laughs> but just as it would seem like it was getting to go, it ended. And I was like, well, you didn't even end. You just, like, the next portion should be happening. And you just said, yeah, we're going to stop the movie here. You went, nah. Yeah. All right. Um, next time. <laughs> and then the other movie that is <laughs> The Old Guard from Netflix. Because by the end of it, it, it tells a complete story. But again, you realize at the end of it, we just saw the prologue. The real meat is what follows. Right. And they, and they mm. set up a the villain for the next one. And I was like, as it was being set up, I went, oh, you're not going to 
you're going to pay that, this off at all. I know you're stringing this one along for the next one. So, yep. yeah, that kind of bummed me. Got to, uh, got to get those people in for the next subscription round. You know, yeah. what it's like. <laughs> um, this is a fun one. The I Don't Even Remember You Award. Because inevitably when I see all these movies and I look at the list, there's a couple of titles that I'll be like, what's that? I got to go to Google and figure out what that is. Right. <laughs> so sure enough, that happened with uh, three movies this year. Well, one of them was called The Laundromat, mm -hmm. which I s barely remember, but like, uh, uh, oh God, what's her name? She's like America's, uh, the, the best actress that we have. Um, Streep, Beryl Streep. Meryl oh, okay. Streep's in oh. it. It's a Steven Sonnenberg movie. Uh, Meh. I just, I don't rem I'm, I couldn't tell you what it's about even after looking it up recently. That's all oh, right. <laughs> okay. That's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, another movie called In the Shadow of the Moon, which was mildly fantasy, had some time travel elements in it. Mm-hmm. And I kind of vaguely remember a scene or two from it, but yeah, I had to look it up and go, yeah, I really don't remember you either. Mm. And then there was a French film called Lost Bullet that was an action movie and had driving in it. And that's about all I can tell you. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then okay. we have... And then we have the, uh, this one was not as all that exciting as it was in years past, but to the, yes, this is the first time I've gotten around to seeing an award. In other words, the movie's been out for a long time and I only just now saw it. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one's called Limitless, which is a uh, Ryan Reynolds movie where he gets Ben Kingsley's mind placed inside of him so oh, that yeah. Ben Kingsley can continue living. Um, but then he starts remembering his past. Oh, I right. I don't okay. know. But he also yeah. has, like, powers of some sort. I don't know. It's kind of... It was interesting. Not a bad watch. The thing that shocked me, though, was there's this filmmaker who just goes by one name. His name is Tarsum, who oh. does incredible visual films. He did The Cell, and he did um, The Immortals, and what else did he did? He, he's done some really trippy visual-looking films, and they're always fascinating to to watch. And I get to the end of the movie, and his name popped up as the director. And I went, what? <laughs> so right. the, the best I can uh -huh. figure was he was in director jail, and they went, okay, so you have to do a movie for us. <laughs> director and, jail. <laughs> and just show us that you can actually make a regular movie. And this was his regular movie. <laughs> right. And then the uh, the other one that I saw was uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, which is a documentary about uh, this director from the 60s named Jodorowsky who was off his rocker nuts um, <laughs> <laughs> and wanted to adapt Dune having never read the book. Um, okay. Which is a good place to start. I but, would have thought that probably when you're thinking of doing a movie, you'd probably start with reading a book or some prior art with the movie. You know, you would think. Um, mm. I think somebody gave him like the abridged quick rundown of it. And he was like, yeah, 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 I want that. And <laughs> But he's one of these guys who is, he's an artist and an artist. wants to give an experience. And who cares yeah. if it completely bastardizes what the material is coming from, so long as you have an experience that makes you feel and, you know, affected okay. you in some way. So right. on that respect, I'm happy that he didn't make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, though, virtually the entire team he assembled went on to go work on Alien. Okay. That's uh, interesting. Yes. So... Other than him, <laughs> your script, your 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 screenwriter, your production designer, your effects designer, your uh, uh, Giger himself, they were all on this movie. They all went and then worked on Alien. Apparently, he also assembled this 
absolutely ginormous book because he storyboarded, painted, art directed every single scene ahead of time. Okay. And then took this hardbound book to Hollywood to sell the movie. Okay. Here's the thing. I think it scared a lot of the studios because they went, ooh, that's going to cost a pretty penny. Yeah, wow. All these sets you want me to make? Far out. Jeez. Right. Here's the other thing. So many of the things that are in that book found their way into other movies. Really? For instance, his opening shot started at the far end of the cosmos and in a single take flew in, flew in, flew in, scope, 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 until eventually landing on Dune in a close-up of I don't know who. The movie Contact did the exact shot in reverse. Right. Okay. Like the exact shot. <laughs> like storyboard exact. Yes. Yeah. Because right. apparently, although I think they said that there were three copies of this book made, only one or two of them are known to exist still. Oh. And they think that one of those books made the rounds because that's not the only bit from it. There apparently are all sorts of bits from it that have found themselves their way into all sorts of science fiction movies since. Is there like a is there like a website on there that documents all the scenes from this book? No, I don't think anybody yeah. has actually done Cause that. Because that would be a really interesting website. Yeah. I think. Don't you think? Yeah. Hmm. So you know, anyway. I've I've got some a very thin list of movies that I have watched this year. And it's pretty much in the last quarter of 2020 because I just said, you know what? I'm catching up on all the pop culture I missed in the last 10 years. So some of that is even further than 10 years ago. And <laughs> you, I know that um, you were shocked and appalled to hear that oh. this year is the first year that I watched Alien and Aliens. Just terrible. Just terrible, Jared. <laughs> I know. Terrible oversight. But did you then go and play the the aliens in, you know, Zen's aliens and go, Mm. oh. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I totally get it now. Um, (laughs) And and see, this is the thing that I've been doing this year. I've been using video games and pinball as an excuse to watch watch a thing, watch a franchise so I can understand it better. I did it with Rick and Morty. I watched all the Rick and Morty episodes up to whatever it is, season four. Um, so I could understand the pinball machine better. And that was well worth it because it's full of tropes from the show. And you'd need to really understand the show to get the value out of it. It's very funny when you do. Um, and uh, I think that was the main one that I decided to do. And once I started doing that, I thought, you know what? It would be really, it would make sense that I go and watch these other ones as well. But, you know, just because. And yeah, I, I totally agree that watching Aliens definitely worthwhile if you enjoy um <laughs> if you haven't like me watched it like i don't know how and you want to get some more value out of the pinball machine um and like this i now see the the sound design the actual way they've made that pinball machine is just so accurate um to the movie it is astounding yeah and um it, they have, i now know why it is your number one pick for for tables in the genre it is just perfectly executed yep. um, from a pinball machine perspective. Watch. Uh, so I also watched Covenant as well um, mm. and um, and sort of did that. Um, on your recommendation, I haven't done Alien 3 um, and I don't think I will. Um, I think I've already watched Prometheus, which is sort of like the other side of Covenant really, mm-hmm. isn't it? So mm-hmm. I think I've already seen that. I'm, I might watch it again just to refresh my memory. Um, so I think I've got all the aliens covered now. But what I've been doing is um, I've got access to a friend's Plex server and um, I've been going through all the sci-fi and I went and watched this movie called Battle Royale, which is a Japanese movie. Are you familiar with it? Um, yeah, it's essentially uh, the Hunger, Hunger Games. The Hunger Games. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's pretty much what it is, but it's way more gruesome. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's very odd and... I'm glad I watched it so I could see the genesis of what Hunger Games is, essentially. Yeah. But it was a weird movie because it was Japanese and they're always a little bit oddball. They're a little Um, So, yeah. Um, I watched the remake of... um, What is the name of it? 
I mean, you probably know the it's an anime movie and it's the one where they have the big city in the sky and they have the the robot in the end scene where they climb up the big tethered rope that like um holds the city in place and the big ring comes down shreds the robot oh that's a, a, battle angel a leader. leader yeah i watched a remake of that um loved it um thought it was really good wait what do you um, mean a remake the, the movie version of it. The, like, That's not, not a remake bit. of anything. Alita's, as far as I know, Alita was never an anime. It was a manga, no. uh, 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 you know, a book, but it's never been a movie to the best of my knowledge. Uh, it's, I saw the anime when I was younger. Oh. It, it exists. Okay. Yeah. I remember that scene with the big, like the animated yeah. version of that thing sliding down the thing and that robot getting shredded. Like it's it's a thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> definitely a remake. Um, so that was great. Yes, I um, like that movie a lot. I think they did it. I think they did it much better. The remake felt really good to me, and yes. I think they did a great job on it. Um, so yeah, that was great. Um, what else did I see that was good? Obviously, all the Rick and Morty. Very glad to watch that. It was awesome. Um, and I'm slowly working my way through. You know, I I had to buy some stuff on Amazon, and um, I hadn't taken advantage of a Prime subscription, so I I joined up for the 30 days you know just to do it and i've been going through their um their prime video and i'm almost tempted to go and watch the only series of amh american horror story um because i haven't seen that either so i don't know i know that i know that's something that's close to you chris uh but um i might have worked on yeah. a season or two hmm <laughs> I get, uh, it's only showing season one at the moment, but I'm sure that it, once I do season one, it'll show the other seasons. So truthfully, I'm thinking of it. Truthfully, the uh, the first season's good. Third season is good. Everything else after that, Avoid. And, and to me, the the returns get after I learned by being there, learned how the show was made. Um, my enjoyment of it fell off a cliff because mm. I realized that. They're making it up as they go. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why suddenly plot lines are just dropped and interesting villains are just dropped because they didn't have faith in it and they decided to move on to something else. So, Okay. Interesting. Um, but as a complete story, the first season's good and the third season is good. So they are they do it a little bit like Stranger Things in that they they sort of have a whole story per season and they follow it through mm -hmm. to the end. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good. Well, that's I like that. Oh, that's the other thing. Stranger Things I watched this year as well oh, for like so the good. first time ever. Yeah, so oh, good. incredible. Yeah, I loved it again for the for the pinball so I could understand it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So it's been an interesting year watching. I've actually been able to sort of participate this year a bit more in the movies of the year. Um, than I normally had in the past. So it's been good. I, I will continue to do so. Fantastic. Well, gang, we've... Uh, wow, that was an extra long episode. Um, We're going to have to slice that one up, Chris. <laughs> yep, I'm going to have to be slicing and dicing here. Um, but we've got interesting things in the works, folks. Mm. Interesting. We might be doing real soon something that some of you have been begging us to do for a long for years. time. Yeah. Years. We might actually have an entire episode dedicated to, drumroll, VR. <gasps> mm-hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, we, it's, it's, I think it's going to be a thing. It's going to be a In thing. 2020 and it, and is uh, 2021. It's going to be the year of the VR. It's, it's going to be a thing, and it's probably going to be a thing much sooner than you think it's going to be a thing for us to do. <laughs> mm, yes. Yeah. So that is what you can, you can definitely look forward to that. Uh, beyond that, hey, the year is wide open. We're not sure what it's, uh, obviously, what to expect, what it's, what it's bringing. Um, but we've got our eyes wide open. We're... Ears to the ground, listening. We've been probing, trying to find out uh, information that you all would want to know. So it's just a matter of time. Uh, CES is happening this week virtually. I know that Arcade 1UP has some stuff that they're going to be announcing. Uh, we'll see if any of it involves pitball. Highly unlikely, other than wild rumor being that we might see the uh, a Universal uh, Studios cab announced announced that would yeah, be nice that would be nice um would be even nicer as an aliens cat <laughs> you know what if the universal studios one does well 
and like it's plastered with Jurassic Park stuff, then maybe that would open the doors up for aliens. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. One can hope. <laughs> that's right. So anyway, that's, a, the, you know, wish we could promise and tell you things that we we're going to be doing for the new year, but uh, hey, we really don't know. We don't know, but we'll be back. We'll be talking. And as usual, it'll include Jared's favorite stuff. Stuff and things. Till next time, folks. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>